All right, well, I have three after, so we will go ahead and get started for tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Dwayne Brejak. I am the executive director for the Michigan chapter of NASW. Uh, we are so excited to have you all here from across the country today to join us for a important discussion on how to land your social work dream job. Um, we are very happy to have a uh, expert in our field and a fabulous social worker, Michelle Woods, who is the Director of Career Services at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Uh, my alma mater, I'm going to have to say a little go blue. Got some yes. good football still to come <laughs> this year. Um, but today we're going to talk about how to best kind of project yourself to an employer, uh, tips for creating resumes and cover letters, uh, have some time for hopefully you all to get your questions answered about what you need to know about entering the job market right now, um, sharing resources, feel free into the chat. I will be putting several uh, links in and for everybody today. One will be a, uh, a folder with a bunch of handouts and resources, including a copy of tonight's PowerPoint. Um, we will also be sharing a couple of the upcoming events with, with folks. I, I already dropped one, uh, which is our student series, which we do one of these every month. Um, our first January event is going to be preparing for your early career, and we'll have a panel of social workers from across the country talking about different areas of practice and career trajectory. And then on January 31st, we will be hosting a national career fair. So especially if, as we transition today's conversation into practical application, if you're still going to be looking for a job towards the end of January, we will have a uh, uh, that opportunity available and open to all social workers. Um, so with that, we're on till about 7.30 uh, Eastern time today, if we need it. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michelle to get us going. If you have questions during today, please feel free to drop those into the chat box or use the raise your hand feature, and, and we will uh, call on folks as we, we get to the question section. So very excited to have you all, and it's off to you, uh, Michelle. Great. Thank you, Duane, for that uh, really nice introduction and for inviting me to uh, speak today. I'm always excited to talk about uh, the job search and especially the field of social work. Um, it's exciting and it's always good to see what uh, students are interested in and what their career journey is going to be or what look like um, in, in the near future. So uh, thank you all um, for uh, joining me today and for coming into the field of social work, which is, is greatly needed. Um, on the title, uh, it, it says best practices for landing your first MSW job, but I realize that some of you may um, be uh, in BSW programs as well. Uh, so this is applicable for, for you all uh, as well. So um, just my, my mistake uh, at Michigan, we only have the MSW in the, in the PhD uh, program. So I was in that mindset originally um, putting these slides together. I uh, work at, at U of M in the School of Social Work uh, there. Um, and in our career services office, we uh, provide professional development and support for the uh, social work students in the program and often meet with students about their uh, career um, journey as well, um, a little bit of career coaching. So um, in the uh, slide is my email address to the office. So if you have any questions after today, even if you're not a uh, MS, I mean, a, a student in our program, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I can certainly answer questions or if you have follow-up information that um, you would like to convey or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. More than welcome to do that. Um, I'm going to proceed. We're going to talk a lot about um, the uh, job search. And I just want to start off by saying how uh, exciting a time it is. Uh, I belong to a group of career services um, professionals and staff at, it's a national organization for uh, social workers um, that are in a uh, field of education and uh, professional staff who are, who are working with social workers um, at different schools of social work across the country. And we have been talking about how exciting of a time it's been um, and that there has been a large increase 
and demand for social workers across the board and nationally. So you're one, it's a great time to come into the field and to um, be job searching, <laughs> excuse me. According, one of the stats I have on the slide is that the social work profession is uh, expected to continue to grow um, over the next uh, several years. The Bureau of Labor Statistics that keep track of um, different occupations and what is expected to grow um, in the future has um, stated that our profession is gonna continue to grow about 9% over the next decade, which amounts to about 74,000 uh, new job openings on average per year. Um, over the next decade. So they're expecting social work uh, profession to continue to grow. And you should also note that, um, and you've probably noticed this during COVID, um, the uh, grain <laughs> of the profession of different professionals across the board, people are retiring. And also uh, COVID uh, really, opened up the great a great need for uh, different occupations. And so that is contributing to the growth in the social work field and also retirement is contributing to the growth in the social work field. It is, <laughs> excuse me, my, um, my voice is crazy over the next, um, I've been doing a lot of talking this fall and uh, so excuse me on that. Um, the uh, HR uh, professionals, um, hiring uh, managers often report that um, networking is the number one um, way that most people find um, their job. That's the most effective and cost um, effective way of finding out opportunities, landing jobs, um, and then uh, they reported about a third of the new hires that they brought onto their organizations were hired through referrals. So that is a lot of people who are getting endorsements, referrals, um, letters of recommendations or connections um, by just networking. Um, <clears throat> they're also posting more jobs online. One of the things that happened over COVID is the movement of a lot of not only networking, um, but uh, po job postings and information um, related to employment was driven all online. And so um, I, you would find that the mo majority of time postings are held online, a lot of job fairs are held online and the application process and even the interview process is being held online. So one of the things that you would have to get more comfortable with, and many of you did this, is moving within the online space, getting used to technology as a tool for your job search and being very comfortable in that space. Um, also, uh, employers reported that they typically will have several rounds of reviews uh, or interviewing. So there may be an initial um, kind of review of, of resumes and applications. So there's a first cutoff by just looking at your materials and then they may have um, a half an hour short um, online interview through um, Zoom. And then there may be another interview once they have maybe their final top candidates, and that might be three people. They might bring you in or have an additional um, in-person for an interview or have an additional online interview, depending on if you're, you're interviewing very close to where you're located or you're interviewing out of state. So be prepared for um, maybe multiple levels of, of interviewing um, and also um, being prepared uh, that uh, 
candidates are, they're going to be a screening process and that um, employers are not going to bring in a large amount of individuals for interviews. They're going to have a screening process and then select few for interviews. And COVID-19 has amplified this a lot um, in terms of online, in terms of having the screening uh, of time. There are people who are <laughs> uh, hiring managers, have um, multiple responsibilities. So they're trying to get the most um, uh, effective way of hiring individuals uh, and the time commitments that they have. And so that's the reason why you might expect uh, multiple levels of interviews or um, having to um, you know, post information online and then have a screening and then another interview. So just be pre prepared for this. Um, during the time, I'm going to talk more in depth about these key steps. So these are um, the aspects of job preparation and searching that you should keep in mind and be prepared to do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about identifying what type of job you're interested in, completing a, an assessment of where your skills are, um, your personality strengths, um, talking about learning how to tell your story. It's important that you do this assessment about the job you want so you can understand and talk about what your background, your knowledge, your skills and experiences are that lend yourself to being the best candidate for the position. Um, those um, exercises or learning how to do that really informs how to write your resume and your cover letter that would be most effective for an employer. And we'll get into that in more detail. You also should think about after you've done all of this, where do you want to work? When you think about what type of job you want, uh, geographically, where do you want to work? Um, and then you're going to start to think about what are some of the resources out there that can help you uncover what organizations, agencies, websites, professional organizations that you're going to network with or look into to try to uncover uh, those job opportunities. And then it's important to network, to think about getting yourself out there, um, creating an online uh, footprint, uh, because as I was saying, COVID has drawn a lot of this networking online. And so it's important for you to have that type of presence out there. You also should think about practicing uh, interviewing and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let's talk about identifying uh, your, uh, your job. <clears throat> and what you want to do is to really think about why you came into the field of social work what is it that you want to do when you finish uh, your BSW or your MSW program? What type of social worker do you want to, to be? What do you want to, to do? What type of social worker are you interested in? Is there a particular population that you want to work with? Uh, many of you came into the field of social work because you're interested in addressing a particular social issue or problem. Is that tied to the type of career that you want to have eventually? Um, what setting do you want to work in? Are you interested in a medical setting? Are you interested in, in to be a school social worker? Do you want to have a career in higher education uh, working to reduce the gaps in higher education for um, a particular population? Are you interested in more macro areas of social work and want to be an analyst for, say, a government agency? Are you interested in research? Um, so you want to go on and, and get a PhD, be an academic, because that can be a social work career as well. Uh, do you want to work um, in the nonprofit space, do you want to work in non-traditional settings, a for-profit space? Do you want to go into private practice? So really think about what it is that you want to do in your career 
um, and write that down. Um, a lot of people have vision boards or they may have a, a file or folder in um, their computer that lists their, their uh, goals. And so that's important for you um, to do that because you want to, it's going to inform what type of search engines that you um, search for, what type of um, jobs that you apply for, what professional organizations and networking that you want to do. It's going to inform also uh, how you're going to put together your resume and your cover letter. So spend some time assessing what it is that you want to do, write it down, and then write down maybe what your two-year goal is. Uh, if you're in an MSW program and you're interested in clinical work, two-year goal might be to gain your clinical license and gain a certain type of expertise in um, trauma-informed therapy. So what it is about your entry-level goal or, or um, entry-level career, what it is that you want to do in two years, and then maybe five years down the road, <clears throat> because one, sometimes you're in an interview, an organization may ask you, an employer may ask you what your long-term goals are. How do you see yourself growing with this organization? Um, and sometimes the type of organization you might apply for will help support your long-term goals being able to gain the supervision and the expertise in an area of social work, for instance. So it's good to know that off, to, off as you think about what your career is. And one piece of advice, and I have some slides about informational interviewing. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about informational interviewing, but it's a, a way to uh, have small meetings with professionals in the field that you're, or the industry that you're interested in um, and ask them about their career directory, um, trajectory, uh, what type of skills that they have used, um, how did they gain employment in the industry, information about salary expectations. Uh, so you can gain a lot of insight for just doing informational interviews with people who are doing the work that you're interested in doing at organizations or industries that you're interested in working in. So informational interviews is a great tool uh, to help you formulate what your career or um, uh, positions can be uh, or uh, to better inform what you're already interested in. Excuse me. So as we talk about um, what your goal is, your professional um, position, and where you would like to work, it's important for you as you think about that position, why you should be hired. Um, and so that helps you plan out a lot of things. So thinking about uh, a, a specific position, and I'm going to use, an, uh, say, an analyst uh, as an example, say some of you um, had indicated that you're interested in policy and research. And sometimes the uh, some of those positions are called analyst positions specifically when you are in a more uh, governmental agencies. And so say you're interested in being an analyst, so that's your, your position, then you're gonna start thinking about what type of skills do I need to have or to focus on to be hired as an analyst? And do you have those particular skills? And where have you gained those skills from? So doing a skill inventory based on your past experiences and your accomplishments as it relates to the position you're interested in gives you insight into where you are in your professional development and also uh, what skills have you developed that are related to the position that you can talk to the employer about when you go in your interview? And also what can you write in your resume and your cover letter about those skills? And a lot of times 
employers for different positions in job descriptions will list skills that they are looking for for those positions. And so um, you'll want to make sure that you're connecting the dots for the employer, that you are the best possible person for that position. So essentially why you should be hired for that position over anybody else that they're um, interviewing. And so you're uh, doing this assessment by keeping track of your accomplishments. Uh, so a lot of you have leadership roles within the university um, and student organizations. You're accomplishing different skills in your field placement, your internships, volunteer work. You wanna keep track of those. You wanna keep track of also um, coursework when you're developing a certain expertise, a specific population that you're learning about as it, uh, as it relates to the position you're interested in, research that you've done that's related to maybe the population you wanna work with. So are you uncovering aspects of, of research that will inform your practice that you're proud of or developing your research skills if you're interested in more um, macro types of practice? So that's all about skill inventory and assessing where you are at this point as it relates to the job that you're interested in. Um, and um, I included uh, certifications, a lot of you through your field placement have opportunity to gain specific certifications or trainings, keep, tra keep track of those because that you will um, be better prepared to talk about those and to demonstrate those on your resume as it relates to positions that you're interested in. And when we talk about personality strengths, um, I had mentioned that a lot of you are um, in volunteer work and in leadership positions at your uh, school. Um, and so those are personality uh, or personal characteristics that you're developing that are outside or addition to skill development. So are you developing those leadership skills? Are you a visionary? Are, are you good at organizing and motivating people? Are you good at engaging individuals? Are you highly organized? Those are personality strengths that you can talk about uh, in an interview. And they're also personality strengths that help you uh, with um, your resume and also help you uh, when you are talking in your cover letter about why you're interested in the position, why you're a good person to call for an interview. And so um, all of that assessment, your own personal assessment should be really based on real life experiences. Um, we, you want to be as authentic as possible about your own history and your own experiences. And you wanna have some concrete evidence to support your skills. So for instance, if we go back to the analyst position and um, one of the skills that you have developed the field placement is the, um, uh, the, the development of survey instruments um, or surveys and focus groups. Those are some skills that analysts will use to gather dat uh, data. Um, if you've used that in your field placement, those skills, then you can use your field placement as a story. So if an employer asks you about uh, how, what type of skills do you have that's related to managing data, you can directly think about your field placement and say, I had a, in my field placement, I developed a survey, I conducted focus groups. You have a real life story that substantiates the evidence and the skills that are listed on your resume. And you should do that um, as you are preparing for your job search um, and you're thinking about putting your resume and your cover letter together and preparing for your interviews because that'll help you determine um, you know, what you wanna focus on. It also uh, get you closer to 
being prepared for interviews and different questions that might come up about your past history. And so I have down there as, as well, um, a good way if, if you're kind of stuck on what particular skills that you have that might be related to different positions um, or jobs, then reviewing job descriptions that are out there can be very valuable uh, to kind of help you think about what skills are related to different positions. And going back to informational interviewing, um, in addition to looking at job descriptions, informational interviewing, you can ask about what particular skills are really important for being successful in this in that particular type of job that you are doing the informational interviewing for. And that can help you think about different skills that you might have that are related or things that you might wanna work on uh, as you prepare for um, jobs. Right there um, is, uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit about macro um, jobs. Because I talked about descriptions, and it's easier for clinical social workers to find job descriptions out there and job postings, just because if you just simply put in, uh, you know, a therapist, cl a clinician, case manager, or case worker, or direct services, or social worker, for instance the majority of types of jobs that come up are going to be the direct services and the clinical um, realm, um, what we call micro social work. In macro social work, because our field is so broad <laughs> that oftentimes, um, and macro social work is a curricular term uh, for just social work schools. And so um, when you are searching for uh, social work jobs that are more macro based, they typically do not have social worker <laughs> in the job title. Um, so with macro work, you have to be a little bit more creative about different job titles. And these are some examples from some of our alum in our MSW program of all the different types of job titles that macro social workers have, like analyst or a coordinator positions, <clears throat> manager, administrator, team leader, they're called everything else except for a macro social worker. Um, and so when thinking about different job descriptions and titles, I don't want you to get lost and think that there are not jobs out there that are focused on macro social work, they just have different job titles that you're going to have to look at. Michelle, that's very helpful. Yes. A couple of questions that come came through okay. about the last couple of slides. Um, okay. And I have a couple of questions about recording. Yes, we will have the recording available. It should be online probably by next week. So if you just go to the national NASW series, uh, student series page, uh, the recording and then the handouts for any of the sessions are, are up there at any time. Um, I love you talking about skill assessment. I, I think for folks who have a semester left or more, this is especially helpful as you start to build out your learning agreement and what are the skills that you want to get before you mm -hmm. graduate? Because you don't want to make sure that you are graduating and then every job that you want is asking for something that you haven't built yet. So if you've got some time left in your program, definitely be looking. And I love looking for um, uh, reviewing job descriptions, seeing what's out there, especially for things that you you would want as an individual social worker. That's a great way to to, to develop that skill inventory. Um, and then I think the job titles and e even the skill inventory list can be very helpful for folks. So thank you for sharing this. Um, one of the other resources that is in the, the handout folder is a professional development booklet. It's one that we created in Michigan uh, a few years back and updated it, but there is a kind of a laundry list of, of skill descriptions in there. Good. And so, nice. so what I often do with students too, is I just say, go highlight everything that you do <laughs> or have done. And mm -hmm. then it's helpful, like you said, probably to write out some more specifics about what you did in your internship or your job or your mm -hmm. volunteer expertise that was related to that particular skill in case you get those questions asked. 
because there are going to be repeated words that you will likely see in job descriptions and, and making sure that you are um, matching whatever the language is in the, in your job description that you're applying to, to your resume, because sometimes they'll throw you through a word search. Um, right. But a couple of questions. So you, you had talked about uh, salary requirements and informational interviewing being a really good tool to sometimes get at that. Um, so how, how would you recommend that someone handles a question around salary requirements if the job posting doesn't include a range? And then there was somewhat of a follow-up question. Um, in some states, it's illegal to ask. Um, and then there's some states that are the opposite, that it's required that it's posted. So right. I mean, in a general sense, what are some tools that you would uh, advise folks in terms of salary range questions? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the informational interview is um, not done during an actual interview. The informational interview is fact finding before you go in for any types of, of interviewing. So the informational interviewing space is the perfect time to ask those uh, ask questions because you're really just researching the profession. So you're not in a formal interview. Um, you are, uh, many of you have done informational interviews when you were searching for uh, social work programs. You went in and met with a counselor, an admissions counselor at the university, and you ask a lot of questions about the school. You know, what, what types of financial aid do you have available? Uh, what types of, of other types of support do you provide students? What's the curriculum like? What are the curriculum choices within the school? That was an informational interview that you were doing with an admissions counselor. So the same rule would apply or um, atmosphere applies when you do an informational interview with someone in the industry. You are doing a fact-finding search <laughs> on what it is like to work at that organization or within that um, position. And so the person that you, the employer um, or the staff member that you connect with to do the informational interview um, with, when you uh, reach out to them, you typically will introduce yourself as, you know, I'm currently in the social work program, getting ready to graduate, or I just graduated. And I'm trying to find out as much information about how to position myself best for this, for this type of job. And I would love to talk to you about your career journey. So when you get into that space, the questions that you're uh, asking them is about their career journey. And there's also one of the questions that you can throw out there is um, I'm uh, interested in knowing if you know what the salary range is for positions, for entry level positions or these types of positions. So you're not asking that person directly how much they make. You're just generally asking if they know what a salary range is for these types of positions. And so that's perfectly fine. You're not any type of formal um, interview or anything. So <clears throat> the, the rules that you were talking about, Dwayne, or the person who asked the question is related to formal um, interviewing um, and, uh, and job, the formal job process. So during an interview, um, some states are prohibiting um, employers for asking those in the interview about their salary, it's about their salary expectations. And that's because some people have been taking advantage of, of individuals um, in, uh, if you don't have, if you don't know, <laughs> or if you totally uh, uh, produ uh, produce a number that's significantly lower than what uh, they typically would offer. Sometimes they've um, offered a really low um, salary to someone. So in some states are trying to pre prevent that type of exploitation. And so that's during a formal interviewing process. And then some um, states or industry or organizations have, they want the salary range to be listed on the posting 
because that will provide some transparency for you as you look for jobs. You're not applying for a job that is below the salary range that you are expecting to make. And for the employer side of, uh, it's important for them to list what their salary range is because maybe they there are confined between uh, amounts. And so they can't, for the particular position, they can't uh, pay over a certain amount. So they are providing, being transparent about what salary range they can offer so that they're not making a final offer to someone who won't accept it because it is below range that they want. Yeah, that's very helpful too. And when it comes to, you know, salary searching, depending on the sort of organization you're applying for, you know, some nonprofits have their, their data on yeah. uh, like GuideStar, for instance, GuideStar. Right. And so you can find sometimes salary information, but mm -hmm. social, we're, we're kind of a small field, right? So sometimes it's right. like, you know, and how much of a network have you built? And do you know somebody who works at that organization already mm -hmm. who kind of has the insider scoop, especially right. if you can't figure it out elsewhere. Because right. I think it's important for a lot of people who, you know, do I waste my time applying for a job if the salary range is lower than I, I would even accept at the minimum level? Right, definitely. And that's why the informational interview is so important, connecting, networking with alumni from your institution is important as well, because they can also give you some insight. Um, having a discussion with your field supervisor. I know a lot of students prior to uh, graduating or during the course of the time where they're spending with their field site, they are um, uh, having conversations with their supervisor about the type of jobs that they're interested in. And it's okay to ask your supervisor kind of what is the salary range for these type of positions within this organization and that field supervisor may share some of that information with you. And if you have the opportunity to participate as part of a hiring committee while you're in your field placement, that is will also inform you about not only about the process <laughs> um, of being on the other side, uh, but also about salary negotiation um, as well as it, it as relates um, and what you know what uh, employers think about doing as they uh, make offers and uh, what that process looks like from the other side. So if you have an opportunity to do that, take advantage of, of that and those conversations with your field with your field supervisor <clears throat> or site. I love that as a suggestion. And, you know, even at the beginning mm -hmm. of the semester, if you know your organization is hiring, like many social work organizations yes. are right now, maybe you even try to build it into your learning agreement as, as a skill development, right? Right. That, that's really, that could be a really useful thing later on. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're going to be getting a little bit more into the resume meet yes. in a minute. But the other question that I wanted to, to uh, bring forward before we move on is you briefly mentioned online footprint. I don't know if you're planning to talk more about that today, but maybe if, if not, could you give some some of what not to do with an online <laughs> presence as a social Yeah, worker? I was going to touch on it just a little bit, but I'm not as much as probably um, is needed. But one thing that you want to think about with your online footprint is to Google yourself. <laughs> First thing you want to do uh, is see what comes up. Um, and I'll do that periodically with me um, just because you just never know who tags you for uh, what pictures are put out there, who is tagging you for what <laughs> different events that you go to. And so you want to know what the uh, uh, internet is saying about you. So Google yourself see what comes up. And also um, you want to uh, scrub um, or uh, make private any of your social uh, uh, media accounts. So if you are doing crazy kind of, you know, fun, it could be fun and crazy uh, mixture of TikTok videos and, and you don't want that to be a part of your your professional presence because it's not appropriate, then you want to make sure that it's private. And, um, and also uh, with Facebook and Instagram, making sure that you 
have privacy settings set up so that you are only sharing uh, information on pub, uh, in the public sphere what you want your professional presence to look like. Because a lot of employers will Google you as well. They uh, will uh, look at your social media accounts, uh, see what type of postings that you do. If you're blogging, um, they will look at what you're writing in blogs. So you just wanna be very careful about what you have out there that's open to the public. Um, that is a representation of you and your professional self. And um, switch to private when needed. Um, uh, and I, we'll talk about updating your LinkedIn profile. So you wanna make sure you have an updated photo or headshot. Um, and also when we talk about your, we talked about your skill inventory as you're updating your resume and your cover letter, and um, you have skill inventory that you can have on your LinkedIn. Update your LinkedIn to, to reflect your updated skills, accomplishments. You can post your resume on your LinkedIn. You can also post uh, if you have a um, uh, electronic portfolio of a lot of your um, work, um, you can post that to LinkedIn as well. So um, that's what <laughs> what not to do. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, that's great advice. And, and I would just say, if you have really good social media presence and you want that to be highlighted, especially mm -hmm. if you're a job that may may have social media as a part of it, if you link that in your resume, I mean, resumes can be more living documents than I think they have been historically, especially since yes. we're sending things virtually now. So you can link things in there. You know, if mm -hmm. you have a LinkedIn and that's what online presence you would like an employer to look like, if you link that in your resume, they're more likely to click that than like, then just randomly go on Facebook right. or Google you. And so right. it gives you a little bit more power in terms of determining what lens somebody might be looking at you from uh, in terms of your digital space. And so yeah, thank mm -hmm. you for that. Yeah. Uh, and, okay, we'll, we'll pause on questions for now and let you continue on into the resume stuff. No problem at all. So let's talk about resume. So your documents in, uh, in the social work field, and I get this question a lot. Um, there's no hard rule on uh, what type of resume you should have and how many pages. And what I mean by type of resume is that there, and I didn't put it on here, um, there are a couple of types of resumes that are floating out there. Um, there's one that's called a chronological resume. A chronological resume is a resume that has your most recent experiences listed first and then going back to past experiences. So in chronological order, right, from most recent to past. And then there, uh, and it's typically a chronological resume, you're listing your job title uh, as well as the organization, but it's in chronological order. Um, and then that's the most widely used resume. Uh, format uh, out there. There's also what we call a functional resume. A functional resume typically will have your uh, skills listed at the top. So if you have organizational skills, managerial skills, you'll have big headings at the top and then bullet points describing specifically how you have uh, what accomplishments or how you have um, uh, implemented or developed those specific skills. And then chronologically at the very bottom is a list of the different jobs that you've had. So that's a functional resume. Uh, most do not use functional resume. The mostly widely used resume out there is a chronological one. Um, the functional resume sometimes is good for someone who is changing careers. <laughs> so you don't have chronologically a lot of related jobs that you can highlight. So you wanna highlight your skills first 
and then your job second. But that's more, that's not typically with, with students, um, typically those who are you know, changing fields. Uh, so if you have a you know, long history in another industry and you're coming into the field of social work, then maybe a functional resume might be what you would look for, but the majority of you are going to go with a chronological resume. And in social work, we don't have what we call a page limit. We're not like um, like a startup um, um, or tech or uh, law where in business, where in their industry, they really want you, no matter how many years of experience you've had, you have, they want you to have one page, just <laughs> one pager. Uh, in social work, we're not that strict. So typically, if you have less than 10 years of social work related experience, then you are not going over one or two pages in terms of your resume, all right? <clears throat> and then it's important for you to tailor your resume to a specific job that you're applying to. You can have a template of a resume that you develop in a template of a cover letter, but you're gonna tweak that per each job you apply to. And you're gonna keep those in different folders. So when you're applying to jobs, you'll have your jobs folder, um, have a copy of the job description. So cut and paste <laughs> the job description, put that in the folder, the job title and the organization you apply to, put that in your folder along with a specific resume and cover letter tailored to that job. And that is because, um, <clears throat> because of online um, portals, it's easy just to send off resumes across the board. And what will quickly get you not noticed is if it looks like you are not specifically um, I won't say courting, but you're not specifically um, tailoring your, um, your, if it looks like to an employer that just any job would do, you're just throwing your resume out there in the wide world space and hoping that it will stick, then um, that is, is, is a way to not get your, your materials noticed. Because an employer likes to be light <laughs> to, they want uh, employees who want to work for their organization, who are enthusiastic and pays attention to what their organization is about and what the importance of the job is. And so as much as you can connect the dots for the employer and also tailor your materials, the better chance do you have to get noticed um, and be called for an interview because the the goal of your resume and cover letter is to get an interview for the job. So as much as you can tailor it, the better, and speak the industry language. Uh, when Dwayne was talking about keywords um, and we we're talking about looking at job descriptions, as much as you can tailor or repeat some of that language in your cover letter, and in your resume, the better you are at being called for the interview as well, because you know what you're talking about. Uh, you're making connections with the employer and what they're looking for. And it shows a level of, of, of uh, knowledge about some of the key skills, some of the key knowledge like CBT, DBT, um, trauma-informed, crisis management, all of those are our language, uh, our keywords that are in social work. And so do you speak the industry language? You know what you're talking about. So you want to make sure you do that. Um, in your resume, you also want to highlight your knowledge and your accomplishments. So um, not just listing what your job duty. So you're not going to look at, say, uh, reflect on your uh, uh a past job description and just repeat what you were expected to do. In your resume, you're listing in those bullet points 
what you accomplished. What did you do? So were you a part of the interdisciplinary team uh, do, uh, presenting cases? So you presented certain cases um, to an interdisciplinary team and they made decisions. So you able to work interprofessionally. And so they're looking for that. Um, did you learn, do certifications? Did you learn certain uh, therapeutic techniques or beginning the knowledge of learning uh, different techniques? Did you uh, produce a report that was used? Did you write a grant? Those are all accomplishments that you want to highlight. Did you raise a certain amount of money? And so you list the specific amount of money that you raised. And that could be in volunteer work as well as um, in a formal setting. So highlighting your skills and accomplishments, not just repeating what you were expected to do. And then in knowledge, you can certainly list courses that you took that were very specific or tailored to a specific area of social work. So that's part of your knowledge as well. Not only what, what you've done in your field and volunteer work and paid work, but what type of courses did you, did you take that were very specific? Did you create um, a thesis as part of your program? Some of you may have done that. Um, and some of your programs had a, a thesis. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so that's very important. Did you go internationally um, and uh, accomplish uh, work internationally? Um, and then when uh, Duane had mentioned just the skill inventory using strong uh, and descriptive verbs. So each bullet point, um, I, should, I should go back and say <laughs> that when you're putting together your resume, it's important for it to be readable, to be concise. Um, as you think about the one to two pages, uh, you don't want to cram so much information onto one page that it's hard to read. And you don't want so much white space that you feel that you need two pages, two full pages, that you have a lot of empty white space. You want it to be easy to read and understand uh, and clear. So whatever headings that you use, um, headings could be education, social work related experience, volunteer work certifications and licensure, that is mostly headings. So whenever you have headings in a resume, you wanna make sure that the headings make sense and that any of the experiences up under your headings are related to that heading. Um, and so um, when we talk about using strong and descriptive verbs up under each experience, so we have a job listed um, and or an experience such as your field placement and you're trying to describe your accomplishments, you're using strong and descriptive verbs. So if you managed, if you counseled, if you created, if you formulated, if you developed, those are very strong descriptive verbs, not just I worked at, for instance, that is not very specific or strong, right? Um, we talked about using industry language, being mindful of kind of what the language is um, in the industry. Uh, your resume should be based on kind of those real life experiences that you've uh, 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 done in your assessment. When you're thinking about what you wanna say uh, in an interview, what, what are some examples to demonstrate your competency in certain skill and knowledge areas. So those, what we, that's what we call real life examples um, that are specific to you and your history. You'll wanna make sure that you're consistent. So when we're looking at your resume, um, you wanna make sure that uh, if you have, um, uh, if, if it's formatted, uh, say one section sh uh, it should be, your section should be consistently formatted. So you wanna make sure you're using the same fonts, um, same font and the same size font. If you have your dates on uh, the, the uh, say the right side of the page, you wanna make sure they line up. 
you just want to make sure it's clear and it's consistent and it's formatted um, on all pages of your resume. And you want to make sure that you have several people look at it. Um, it could be your uh, a faculty member, it could be a mentor, it could be a career services um, staff member, um, it, it, you could do peer, you know, uh, sharing them with classmates um, as you, you know, look for jobs together. And you just want to make sure that you share your uh, resume and your cover letter with several people just to make sure that you didn't miss anything, because it's really easy to miss something. I've done it, um, we've all done it, where you look at the same document over and over again, and it looks perfect, but, <laughs> but you miss one thing, and then one person looks at it, that, and you're like, okay, it's right there glaring at them, <laughs> at you. So as many people can look at it, the better. Um, and just be mindful that when people look at it, people are going to have some difference of opinions um, about it. And so you just want to be mindful of that because everyone has their own biases or things that they like or don't like. Um, but uh, you want to take that um, as you, uh, with not with a, a grain of salt, but just be mindful that there's some, there may be some biases. You know, some people um, uh, like more color, some people don't. But um, you want to be mindful that that's just maybe someone's personal <laughs> uh, bias. And that what you're trying to look is look for is some is it easy to read? Is it consistent? Um, does does uh, your point come across? Can they easily understand what you're trying to convey and say? Uh, so those are the main points that you really want to convey in a, a resume and a cover letter. Um, I often get how much personal information to uh, add in the resume. And I say, um, I, I would typically, I'm typically a little bit more conservative. Uh, I think that a lot of personal information should be left off a resume, um, kind of unless it really is um, intentional and it really informs your professional self. So if uh, a lot of your, um, maybe some of your volunteer activities may not be re directly related to social work. It may be in a different, totally different area, but it shows um, that, uh, it shows a particular skill that you, that you have, and you just want to um, demonstrate that particular skill. And so that might be some personal information that's not related to social work, um, that could be okay. For, uh, say that you develop um, uh, that you have a side, like a side business, developing. Um, I won't say that's personal information. Um, say um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a good one to kind of demonstrate. Well. Um, this, we have one student who uh, had a side gig as a hairdresser. Uh, and that was uh, something that they included in their resume because they were interested in um, medical social work. <clears throat> and one of the things that she would do would be, um, uh, wigs um, for individuals um, who were going to chemotherapy, helping with makeup and wigs and things. And so that was some personal information. The hairdressing was personal and not related um, necessarily to social work in and of itself. But in that context, it produced something that was about her professional self. Does that, does that make sense? in terms of personal information. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, there's a couple of questions around uh -huh. that. Um, yeah. One, uh, around a, how, what about political affiliations, volunteering? Okay. And that also goes into what if I have union, labor union organizing or kind of revolution, 
revolutionary community organizing experience. When or when, when or where not may that be appropriate to include in a, a social sure. resume? So when we talk about your professional self and that personal information, um, being very intentional in what industry and what organization you're sending the resume to. So is this an organization that you think is very conservative and um, that is not very uh, like a strong suit um, that they would value? Uh, and so it's, you still want to work within that organization, but you want to keep that separate your political affiliation, you wanna keep that separate. And so maybe you might leave that off because of the organization you're applying to. Um, um, and sometimes um, other types of political activity you might wanna leave off uh, because it may conflict with, you don't want your, um, sometimes your political um, uh, some of your activities, your extracurricular activities, you don't want someone uh, having a certain bias towards those. Um, it may be that's okay with you and that organization, you don't want that, that organization to know about it. And so in that case, you might leave that, that information off of your resume. And then sometimes you that your authentic self are those political, um, those political activities. That's a great, I mean, that's part of the social problem that you wanna address. And so in that instance, you might leave that information in your, your resume, your document, because it shows a different side of you and your, your, um, your political activity. Uh, or your extracurricular activities, that is, that is a part of you. And that is a part of what you're presenting with this to this organization. Yeah, I, I agree, Michelle. And a lot of it is like, mm -hmm. are you applying for the right organizations to begin with? Like if you have a really True. strong value or if you're right. really political, like, and you're one of those folks who can't really turn it off, like maybe you want to work for a political organization or a candidate or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be a campaign manager or an election staffer or something like that, where it's going to be really appropriate. I mean, I've got political stuff on my, my resume because that's part of what I do. And, and right. you know, it may, may not be as appropriate for some jobs where, where you're going to mm -hmm. want to tailor, again, tailor every resume for the job you're applying for. And if you're really, say, uh, into labor union organizing, there are going to probably be jobs that you don't want to apply for uh, if, if that's an important factor for you when you get into the field or um, and knowing the culture of an organization. Sometimes mm -hmm. doing those informal interviews and who right. you know at an organization can be really helpful to get a sense of what is the culture like and am I going right. to even fit in at this organization? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or is it an organization that has a, a strong religious? Um, I mean, there are organizations like the Salvation Army <clears throat> um, where uh, they have a strong religious um, side to them. And so people don't understand that initially. And so sometimes that might be a good, not a good fit um, for you. Yeah, great. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, let's see here. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to add about resumes, um, you can have a link to your social media um, uh, 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 account. So LinkedIn, uh, uh, if you have a professional uh, a, a portfolio, electronic portfolio, you can link to that from your, your documents, your resume. A lot of people are leaving, I should say, leaving their address off of their um, resume because you're putting them out there in an online space. <clears throat> so um, they're just having their their email address on their resume um, and leaving their uh, you know their um, street address off of the resume. I should uh, talk about uh, agency tracking systems. Some of you might apply for organizations 
that are governmental, large organizations and systems where they have a computer do the initial scan of your documents. So your resume, you don't wanna use a lot of color because they're tracking the computer system. A lot of times do not pick up on different color. You don't wanna use tables or columns because these tracking systems cannot pick up. Some of them cannot pick up on tables or columns as well. So if you have that within your resume for those particular organizations or systems, you don't, you wanna have a different type of resume, just a, a basic chronological resume would do. So get rid of like the columns, tables, a lot of color. Um, <clears throat> and then some of you might be interested in applying for an academic position or, um, you know, fellowships or PhD programs, I usually get the, the question about CVs. So a CV is a different than a resume. A resume is typically one to two pages. A CV can go on for 10, 15 pages because it's a historical document. You include everything in your CV. And right there at the bottom, I have links to our career services page at uh, the School of Social Work in the career services page at the University of Michigan, where we have templates. We have uh, templates on resumes. We have some templates, cover letters. We have an example of how to tailor your cover letter to a job posting. Um, and so that's some resources that you can go to. You don't have to be, uh, it's public. You don't have to be a student in our program to access um, those um, resources. Thank you for those resources, Michelle. No um, problem. The, only thing that, uh, the other advice that I, I would have mm -hmm. on the resume side, which also rings true for cover letters, is make sure you're labeling your cover letter and your resumes appropriately when you save them. Um, so make sure your name is in it, at least your last name. And so it's not just resume copy 12, right? Because as right. it goes to the organization, and save them as a PDF when you're sending it on, unless they're asking for some other formatting. Um, because things can change. And so, um, you know, I've gotten a lot of resumes that are titled really strange things. And right, again, right. being as, as consistent as you can about your, your marketing and reinforcing again, it's another way that they're going to see your name too. Right. Good point. I forgot to add that. And I had this, that listed on the side <laughs> to bring up. Um, so yeah, when you're uploading your resume and your cover letter and sending it to a hiring committee or a specific person is good to save it as a PDF with your name um, in the title. And, but with the application tracking system, they don't, it's, it should be a Word document because some application tracking systems cannot read PDFs. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's and the so, only exception. <laughs> yes, and Melissa also made a great comment to say, please make sure to use utilize a professional email address. So yes. if you've got some weird old one that you created that's got maybe some not so uh, <laughs> wording in it, make sure you're using something. Again, the more you can brand yourself, um, the better. Right, right. And then a cover letter, uh, just quickly to go over cover letters, uh, you should never send your resume uh, to a job uh, posting or uh, for uh, 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 for any type of job without a cover letter. Because your cover letter lets the reader the, uh, know, the recipient know why you're sending the resume. Because if you send your resume without anything, then uh, they don't know what job you're applying for. They don't know who it should go to. <laughs> so in order to make sure that your resume gets to the appropriate spot and to the appropriate person or hiring committee, you'll want to send your resume with a cover letter. Um, even if you're uploading your resume into, um, say, uh, uh, application system, if it says upload, then you're also uploading your cover letter with your resume as well. Uh, because most of the time, uh, even if they have a, a portal, the, uh, the, the organization, the hiring committee may print out those, uh, your both documents um, in addition to looking at your application online. So your cover letter goes with 
your uh, resume. Uh, and it has typically four parts to it. Cover letter is usually no more than one page or a little bit over one page at the most. And it has, you know, why you're sending the letter and the resume. So why are you sending the resume? Are you applying to particular job posting? So you list the posting number, the job title, uh, where you ask to send your resume uh, for the job. So you may indicate that a specific person, their name and title ask you to send the resume uh, because oftentimes that's a referral. Um, and so you wanna list that uh, in your initial paragraph while you're sending the resume. And then you start talking about what is appealing to you about that job or organization? Why are you applying for that job? Uh, is it related to the type of position that you are interested in or have always been interested in? Did you develop um, uh, a um, enthusiasm for that particular type of work through your field placement? And so that job is appealing to you, to you because of that. Or did you, is the agency's mission uh, what they're in, or what they're interested in um, addressing as part of their mission is that attractive to you? And that job enables you to fulfill um, that type of mission work. So, what it is about that job or organization, or both, that's appealing to you? And then you start talking about you highlight specific skills, accomplishments. Why do you think you're the best fit? for that job, why you should be called for a, an interview, because that's what your resume and your cover letter, your intent is, is to be called in for an interview. So highlighting specific skills that are related specifically to your experiences. And then you typically will end your resume by asking for an interview. That's, that's what the purpose is. You want to discuss your qualifications in more detail. You can contact me to you know, for an interview or for further discussions about my qualifications at this um, number or email. And that's typically the cover letter. <laughs> Any questions? In the, in the cover letter, you can be a little bit more colorful in terms of your language because you are not having, with, you know, with your resume, it's more bullet points and being, uh, you know, very concise. In your cover letter, you have a little bit more space to demonstrate a little bit more your personality uh, in your cover letter with the words you use and show your enthusiasm a little bit uh, more in the, in the cover letter. Um, as well, or if it's something very unique in your background, say um, if you uh, grew up in that area, a lot of times social workers want to go and work in a community that they grew up in because they have the same, you know, you want to give back, they have the same type of mission. Um, and so if it's that distinctive of you. Um, so you can add a little bit more information about your background and what drew, drew you to that organization or to that line of work um, in your cover letter. Yeah, I, I agree, Michelle. There doesn't seem to be any questions specifically on cover letters, but I would just add that as, as somebody who's hired people before, um, even if a cover letter isn't required, it can definitely be an asset. Um, mm -hmm. To, to send one, especially if there's a large application pool, because it does make it that a little bit more personal. Uh, so I, I always, if you can submit one anyway, because that's your opportunity to really have an organization get to know you a little bit more and your intent of why you're implying. Right. Um, and it can, oh, go ahead. Hello, both of you, um, Michelle and... What is your name, sir? Wayne. Wayne, Michelle and Wayne. Um, in, in my past uh, application for jobs, I, you know, I, I'm a very, um, very enthusiastic about sending a cover letter, but often you're not give, you're not, they don't quote or state a designated name or department. 
-hmm. nothing that you can pinpoint as far as who you're you're trying to mm -hmm. communicate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I I end up using the dear, dear sir or madam, but it seems just so not you yeah. know appropriate for this time in history. It's too cool. right, right. Yeah, sometimes if you can find a specific person, sometimes you can call and get that information because so, some organizations will say no phone calls, please, but most will not have that. So you can call and get an idea who um, to address your cover letter um, to. Um, and then if that's not possible or they have do not, no phone calls, please, then you can put a hiring manager or hiring committee. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, and your, your cover letter can also explain a little bit about your history. Say you returned to, um, uh, you, your cha you changed fields, um, uh, you returned to uh, the field of social work after a long uh, uh, gap because you were um, raising children, so sometimes your cover letter can also explain a little bit about your background that won't be a red flag to an employer as well. All right, thank you for that. No problem. So um, I, I, these are just some suggestions of, of different places where you can find job opportunities. Um, I know with the, like we were saying, there have been an explosion of different job postings and uh, openings for social workers, but sometimes getting an idea of where, <laughs> kind of where to look, look can be um, daunting. So uh, there are you know, many schools of social work, like uh, at U of M, we have public, our uh, job board. So anyone can go and look at the job postings that come in um, uh, to our school. And there are uh, other uh, social work um, schools that have similar postings. So like the University of Maryland in Baltimore has um, a job board that's open. So does um, uh, the uh, USC in California, University of Houston, um, and so there are many different schools of social work where they have just open job boards that they get uh, postings in. And I'm posting on a daily basis and not just for jobs in Michigan, sometimes there are um, uh, jobs out of state as well. Um, you can do a simple Google search, which is really helpful. You can put in a title um, and a location. So if you're interested in youth development in San Francisco, you can put that in Google um, and it will pop up all the um, organizations that have youth development, their tag uh, or their program um, tag um, and give you a list of organizations that are working in that specific area of social work. <laughs> so, that's helpful in terms of just initially searching out there. Uh, there are many uh, United Way pages uh, that are specific to different districts, counties, like Washtenaw County here in Michigan or Wayne County, Cook County in, um, in Chicago. So United Way will often have their agency partners listed, the different uh, organizations that to provide funding to. Uh, so United Way Pages is a good way to find out about organizations. And there are tons of search engines out there like ZipRecruiter, Indeed, you've probably heard of, Idealist.org, Work for Good. Um, there is uh, state nonprofit associations across the United States. So there's the Michigan Nonprofit Association that has a job board. A lot of times, uh, a lot of macro related types of jobs are listed there. Um, 
Don't forget about like professional organizations such as NASW. Uh, there's the American Evaluators Association. There's a young nonprofit professionals network. And that doesn't mean like young in age, it means young to the field. So um, they have all different ages represented. Um, there they have local chapters um, or national chapters. Uh, uh, don't forget the social workers are working in many different settings. So, you know, hospitals, schools, governmental, local, state, county, colleges, universities, all of those have open and public portals where they put job postings out there. So there are sites that you can go to to look for different jobs. And then we had talked a little bit about networking, um, you know, LinkedIn. Uh, it's good if you're um, you know, on uh, Twitter, following uh, different organizations on Twitter, uh, the uh, administration within those organizations, professional organizations have Twitter accounts as well. Just being involved in getting updated news related to the profession. There are professional journals out there, like the Journal of Higher Education as well. Um, <clears throat> so NASW certainly uh, have, <laughs> and schools of social work have Twitter <laughs> accounts. Um, and so you, uh, in terms of networking and getting out there, there are many different social media spaces uh, for you to connect with your school's alumni association. Uh, there are many opportunities to get involved uh, in your alumni association at your prospective schools um, and connect with chapters across, you know, if it's a regional uh, a school or national. So a lot of uh, organ uh, schools have chapters across the country. We talked about networking in terms of informational interview. It's a nice tool to use. Uh, for networking, because with informational interviewing, you are asking, you're not asking someone for a job, you're asking them about their experiences. And social workers like to talk about their experiences. They know what it's like to be new to the field. We're very generous people. And so a lot of social workers are willing to meet and talk with you about their career journey. And it's a great way to meet people and develop mentorships. Um, as well. Um, and don't forget about your faculty, um, networking with faculty in your, your, your classes, your field supervisors as well, people they know or organizations um, that uh, they are involved uh, with. Um, and then we also talked about professional organizations like NASW, um, NABSW as, as well. There's a Christian social work organization. Uh, there's a clinical social work organization. There are many different professional organizations that are related to social work that you can also get involved in that will increase your, your networking um, opportunities. <laughs> and I think that was the um, yeah, that was it in terms of my presentation. Are there any more questions or something? You, that Alyssa, this covered a lot today. A couple, uh, okay. one specific and then maybe more, one more general question. Okay. Uh, this question is a good one from Denise. Can you describe what you mean by a professional headshot or maybe what's not a good photo to use on uh, either LinkedIn or maybe even on your resume should you have a more modern resume? Sure, sure. So a professional headshot, let me see. Um, uh, the best way I can describe it, say that you were um, uh, going, you were publishing a book or you were going to make a presentation at a conference and they ask you for a photo that they can use for the book or to put on their brochure, a, a, a photo. So when you're talking about a professional photo or a headshot, keep in mind of what you were seeing in that instance. 
And that's what I think about in terms of a professional photo. So it's something that uh, looks very polished, something that would be on a, a back of a book or, <laughs> or a bio. If you were passing out a brochure or you were in a booklet at a conference, what type of picture would you want to be in there? And so know in terms of what not to do, uh, not a full length photo. So a lot of times it's like here, <laughs> here enough, it's not all of your whole body in the in the um, in the picture. It's just you. So it's not something that's cropped from, say, a Facebook photo or photo that you put on Instagram that you cropped when you were at a barbecue or outing or something like that. And it's just you in a very casual. So that's not a professional photo. Um, so it's usually something that's very um, intentionally taken <laughs> that represents just you and um, yeah, I think that that's that's helpful. And and I would say that does not mean it can't be a cell phone taken picture. I mean, phones on, right, I mean, right. phone cameras are real quality now. Yeah, uh, and they have some selfie, um, what they call a uh, uh, lens. So if you are, are um, in that influencer space and you have um, that uh, the the camera, then Certainly, if you took a selfie, and that could be very professional as well. Yeah. Um, and then maybe our final question today, and I know people all have to head off. So thank you mm -hmm. for, if you if, for joining us. If you, you have to leave. But um, it, what advice would you give in terms of how far in advance should folks start applying as it relates to their graduation dates? Mm, good question. <clears throat> uh, I can tell you that when we survey our recent graduates about their experiences, they tell us that it took them about two to three months to find their first job. And most of our graduates are uh, within a, a, say a 50 mile radius of the school. So most of them are staying in Michigan um, and those, who report a longer kind of job search um, before they get the first offer are usually um, searching out of state. So sometimes making those connections, it may take a little bit longer, uh, maybe a month or so longer. And then maybe a couple of months, maybe four months might be a, someone's job search experience. If you're applying for a large bureaucracy, say the federal government, <laughs> it takes a little bit longer for them to review your materials, for you to go through several levels of interviewing. Um, so that might take a little bit longer. The uh, and So that might inform your start uh, earlier because you're applying to a, maybe a federal position or you're applying for a large uh, you know, organization like a large hospital system where it may take a little bit longer for you to get through the system. So those um, are kind of the experiences that might take a little bit longer, but from our, um, from our survey for our alumni, it's usually about two and a half months, two, three months of time. <clears throat> Yeah, that that's I think a, a realistic timeline for folks. And you know, as it relates to your licensing too, that may be where a cover letter can be helpful, um, especially right, if you haven't right. received your license yet or in the process of getting it, where you can put that little disclaimer or description mm -hmm. as you're waiting for that to to, to pan out. Right, especially right. if you're applying a month or two before graduation, so you probably haven't even maybe not even begun that process yet. Uh, and so mm -hmm. that can be really helpful to include in a cover letter or an email to an organization as you're applying. Right, right. <clears throat> that was a good question. Yes. So, I mean, thank you again, Michelle. This was super helpful. You're Lots welcome. And I'm sorry about my voice today of all the days to, for it to just crack. And uh, so I hope, hopefully that wasn't too uh, nerve wracking for uh, participants, but I'm sorry. 
<laughs> no, you are fabulous. And so again, we'll we'll make sure that the recording gets up and as well as the link to the handout. Yeah. So it'll be on the uh, NASW National Student Series page. Our next event will be uh, Thursday, January 19th from 6 to 7.30. And that's going to be a panel on preparing for your early career. So we'll take kind of what yeah. we've talked about today to the next level so you can hear or if you have specific questions uh, uh, for practitioners uh, that you'd that like to ask great. about what would be helpful, yeah. we invite you to join that. And then our career virtual career fair uh, is going to be at the end of January on the 31st. That's also free. I dropped those links into the chat a couple of times, but if, if folks have um, other ideas of events they'd like to see, please feel free to reach out to me. Again, I'm Dwayne Brzejak at the Michigan Chapter Office mm -hmm. of NASW, but we thank you all for joining us. I know for yes. some of you, this is the last week of the semester, so right. thank, you. thank you for being here, and I uh, hope you all have a, a, a nice holiday break. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me and thank you for all the work that you all are going to do for the profession. This is exciting for you um, to be in the field of social work. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye.